please help yourself now uh, while we're getting getting everybody mic'd up, and then we will uh, begin shortly. So both our commissioners are here, so we will go ahead and uh, get started. Welcome to New America and our policy forum today, Next Generation Wi-Fi Accelerating 5G for All Americans. My name is Michael Calabrese. I direct the Wireless Feature Program here at uh, New America. It's uh, Wireless Feature is part of our Open Technology Institute, and uh, I see quite a few familiar faces, so I won't talk about what we do. I will talk about um, this new, exciting wireless environment that we are in the process of creating right now. The race to 5G is, and I should put quotes around that, right? The race to 5G is increasingly the number one policy priority at the Federal Communications Commission, and increasingly Influ influencing other debates as well. For example, President Trump has called winning the race to 5G an economic imperative and has announced a ban on the Chinese company Huawei, citing concerns about the security of 5G networks and devices that will soon begin connecting everything in our society, not just smartphones or laptops. 5G wireless networks will be characterized in general, by much higher throughput, enabling gigabit fast speeds, by much lower latency, that is the delay between transmit and receive, less than five milliseconds, and by the ability to connect a much larger number of devices in a small area, not just smartphones, but everything in your connected home or office, uh, you know, from appliances to, uh, to your cars. This Internet of Things connectivity is the real game changer. What you'll hear today is that next-gen Wi-Fi networks will have all of these same 5G capabilities. Wi-Fi will be gigabit fast, low latency, and able to connect a large number of devices, and even prioritize those that are mission critical. Today, unlicensed Wi-Fi is an essential complement to licensed mobile 4G networks. Wi-Fi is the reason warnings of a spectrum crisis a decade ago never occurred, despite a roughly 40% year-over-year growth in wireless data. 
most consumers don't even realize that 70 to 80 percent of the total mobile data, mobile data traffic flowing over smartphones and tablets never touch mobile carrier networks at all and never touch licensed spectrum. Most mobile data uses Wi-Fi to travel a short distance over shared unlicensed spectrum and into the fixed broadband connection that most homes and businesses buy from a cable company, a wireline telco such as Fios, uh, or a wireless internet service provider in more small town and rural areas. And just as Wi-Fi is central to today's wireless ecosystem, next-gen Wi-Fi will be a complement to 5G mobile networks. In fact, as you'll hear, next-gen Wi-Fi will make 5G services more rapidly available and far more affordable, not just in cities and inner suburbs, but to every home and business nationwide. Because mobile 5G networks are massively expensive to deploy, they won't be available outside urban and high traffic areas for many years. Wi-Fi 6, by contrast, can upgrade connectivity in any home or business that has a gigabit capable fixed broadband service, as more than 80 million cable subscribers already do today. In other words, next-gen Wi-Fi can bring 5G capabilities more quickly to urban, suburban, and rural areas alike. <clears throat> But there is a big if. <clears throat> the if is whether the FCC gives America's homes and businesses access to enough contiguous unlicensed spectrum, particularly indoors where they need it. Today you'll hear why the, FCC efforts, the FCC's efforts to open more unlicensed spectrum at 5.9 and across the entire 6 gigahertz band, more than 1,200 megahertz of new unlicensed spectrum capacity is key to unlocking the potential for the U.S. to truly have the world's most robust and equitable 5G wireless networks. So um, next up, uh, we'll have an opening overview presentation so that we all have uh, kind of a clear picture of what, this, of what this trend is, because this is not just another evolutionary step, like going from, um, you know, uh, Wi-Fi wi 802.11n to AC, for example, but a big leap. Um, and that'll be um, uh, Vijay Nagaranjan, who I'll introduce momentarily, then Commissioners Michael O'Reilly and Jessica Rosenworcel will uh, join me up here for um, a discussion, a kind of a fireside chat without the fire. And then finally, a panel of, of four uh, industry experts um, to, uh, to talk about all, and not just industry also, I shouldn't leave out schools and libraries and, and public spaces, which will be included in our discussion. To wrap it up, um, along with your um, questions and comments, um, so, um, so let me, I guess at this time, make sure that, uh, one thing I'll make sure VJ is, is right here. I think they were also uh, so interested in <laughs> catching up with each other here. We bring them out. Okay, we've got the whole crew. So um, to start us off is uh, Vijay Nagaranjan, who is the Vice President of Marketing for Broadcom's Wireless Communications and Connectivity Business Unit, where he's responsible for Broadcom's uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and GNSS products, um, and I believe is, Broadcom is the world's largest Wi-Fi chip maker, roughly? Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, 
So they, they, make the, they make the stuff we need and know all about it. So uh, I'll turn it over to Vijay. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. You know, my presentation is going on. My presentation's on. Okay, hold on for a minute. I'm trying to get my presentation going. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so while the uh, technical difficulties are resolved, uh, let me just get going. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, to uh, give you my perspectives of uh, next generation wireless and uh, more specifically the role of unlicensed PAN and Wi-Fi for say 5G services. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar with Broadcom, Broadcom is one of the largest semiconductor companies. Uh, we've more recently uh, forayed into software as well. Um, we do have a large footprint, footprint in the wireless space. Uh, we do uh, RF front-end designs, front-end filters for uh, 4G and 5G phones. And then we also do Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and GPS that go into your phones, tablets, access points, cable gateways, and so on. Uh, that brings me to the uh, uh, topic of the day. Uh, that I thought I'll discuss with you, which is uh, the role of Wi-Fi in the 5G era. Okay, let's see if this goes now. Not yet. Okay, there. Uh, okay, good. Otherwise, you're just going to say next, but go ahead. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so as we look at, and this is slow. Okay, so as you look at the evolution of Wi-Fi, this is a, a chart that I like to show uh, to, uh, to people. So it's been 20 years of Wi-Fi. We're celebrating 20 years of Wi-Fi this year. And it started from, say, 2 megabits per second back in the days all the way to multiple gigabits per second. Uh, and it has, over these years, uh, manifested itself, morphed itself to support multiple, multiple use cases. So 11B, 11G was, uh, say, designed to support basic internet access, oh, say, man. email. And then as we migrated from 11B to N, which is now retroactively being called Wi-Fi 3, uh, Wi-Fi 4, uh, we have, uh, you know, support for email and reasonable web browsing. The turn of the last decade saw a lot more video consumption uh, taking place among consumers, not just on your phones, your tablets, or PCs, but also in a new class of devices. Uh, and 11AC or Wi-Fi 5 took that head on. Uh, it, it, it tripled the throughputs, increased your coverage substantially, and really enabled the video consumption revolution, as, uh, so to speak, right? So you now have the likes of uh, Chromecast and Roku boxes and so on, which uh, stream video to you at your will, all possible only through Wi-Fi. And as we go to the next generation, as we're looking at newer and newer services, call them you know, new gen services or 5G services, Wi-Fi 6 is a technology that's been designed bottoms up to support all of that. And you see that it not only supports the traditional use cases of email and web and video, it supports a broad range of use cases for a much more uh, uh, broader network or many more users, so to speak, simultaneously. So much that 80% of your mobile data today or your wireless needs are actually on Wi-Fi. And the number varies depends on who you talk to, but you know, long story short, a majority of your wireless needs today are being met with, by Wi-Fi. And yet, I think uh, with all the coverage that has happened around 5G with a lot of perspectives that have been published around 5G, oftentimes the question comes up on whether Wi-Fi will decline as 5G grows. And when somebody asks me that question, my resounding answer is no, it just cannot, it just cannot. Uh, 
And let me use that context to also sort of explain the future of Wi-Fi, what it holds for you, and to cast it in the light of everything you've heard about 5G. From my vantage, 5G refers to any technology that meets a certain set of key performance indicators for the next generation use cases. Could be very low latency, could be uh, very high speeds, higher coverage, higher, spe uh, higher mobility, and so on. And the 5G services vision, right, is basically a bunch of use cases that allow you to have higher data rates being able to support IoT, which is a whole number of devices in a very small uh, area. Having a very, very low latency, which would allow us to support mission critical applications and also some extremely, uh, say, the new gen use cases that the consumers want to have. There's high mobility in cars, and there's also uh, the need for more uh, energy efficiency and spectrum efficiency. All of these, as I see it, uh, sort of makes up for the 5G vision. If you look at how that is being addressed as a technology, uh, cellular 5G, which is what 3GPP is defining, is something that supports these 5G services by using different bands. We call it low, mid, and high. This is only part of the picture. The, the good news is that the uh, definitions from the, from the cellular side definitely meet the KPIs that uh, are desired by 5G or desired for 5G services. However, spectrum propagates differently. You have uh, the physical characteristics of wireless channels are such that as you go higher and higher in frequencies, the propagation is restricted to a much smaller area. As a result, this creates the uh, need for a much higher investment uh, in terms of deploying 5G services, and also brings up a question of whether seamlessness of these next generation use cases is even a possibility. The answer really comes in the form of Wi-Fi. So you have all these different uh, frequency bands having different coverage areas, but you have Wi-Fi that exists in every home. That is ubiquitous, and that's something that you use on a very, very regular basis. Wi-Fi provides you with a very, very cost-effective mechanism to offer cover for 5G cellular services. It not only helps you service the urban environments, but it helps you establish these 5G services in rural America as well. It helps you provide 5G services for devices that don't necessarily have cellular 5G. It, it really creates a complement for everything that is being talked about in the context of cellular 5G. So then you would question as to whether Wi-Fi really meets the KPIs that are being defined by the 5G vision. Yes, it's ubiquitous, but does it meet the 5G needs? As it turns out, Wi-Fi 6 or 11AX, which is the current generation of Wi-Fi, definitely meets a lot of these KPIs for indoor and dense urban use cases. Let's take a few examples. High speeds. So with Wi-Fi 6, we can afford you know, 10 gigabits per second or more, uh, depending on the configuration. So high speeds possible, social, video, and cloud applications as a result. Low latencies. Because of how Wi-Fi 6 is designed, because it's a fundamentally different design that, is, uh, that uses the concepts of uh, OFDMA and uh, other multi-user technologies, it really enables low latency communication that is very critical for some of these advanced use cases. There's power efficiency, higher capacity, and more coverage, all of which come from the fundamental redesign of Wi-Fi 6. As a result, this is how we see the overall 5G vision, right? So there's 5G services that we all talk about, that everybody's talking about, 
And there are two technologies, cellular 5G and there's Wi-Fi 6, that are really complementary to each other in offering those services seamlessly. And what is also happening in the industry is the ability to seamlessly roam between 5G and Wi-Fi 6, thereby creating that continuous user experience for everybody. The summary, though, summary here is that billions of Wi-Fi enabled devices will get access to these 5G services, whether they have cellular 5G or not. So with 5G and Wi-Fi 6, there is an opportunity to go bridge this digital divide together. So uh, cellular networks can offload to Wi-Fi 6. And at the same time, there's also an outdoor, indoor complement where outdoor happens on cellular, indoor almost all your devices are going to be on Wi-Fi. So that is the digital divide that can be bridged if we look at these two technologies in tandem, together uh, with one another. So what's next? So as we move from where we are today to what we're looking at on a going forward basis, we're looking at Wi-Fi in the six gigahertz band. Let me describe that or, or, or the benefits of six gigahertz Wi-Fi uh, in a couple of slides here. So again, uh, next-gen Wi-Fi 6 with 6 gigahertz is, once again, 5G services from the bottoms up. So uh, we're able to get wider bandwidth. We're able to realize the value of wider bandwidth with 160 megahertz if 6 gigahertz becomes available. It's 2x the bandwidth, 2x the throughput. There's more spectrum, up to 1.2 giga gigahertz of spectrum available in the 6 gigahertz band that we could make use of. And uh, lastly, there's also the concept of fully scheduled traffic, where we're able to very, very optimally service all the devices that operate in the 6 gigahertz band, enabling a very efficient use of that spectrum, even more efficient use of that spectrum than has been occurring in the 2.4 and 5 gig band today with Wi-Fi 6. 160 megahertz really helps build on top of the stability that Wi-Fi 6 offers. So today with Wi-Fi 6, because of these multi-user concepts, uh, a lot of our customers, a lot of people are adopting Wi-Fi 6. And they're getting the stability that they want because they're getting throughputs, uh, much better throughputs across the whole home, across the enterprise, and they love the stability that Wi-Fi 6 is creating. 160 megahertz will key in on top of that and enable those consumers to have much wider bandwidths and therefore much higher throughputs, lower latency communication. This can be deployed uh, both in uh, uh, apartments and in dense, dense, dense apartments and single family homes. Now if you look at uh, six gigahertz, it really brings 160 megahertz to life. And today we have uh, Two 160 megahertz channels being available in the five gig band, both of which are limited by uh, DFS, that we have to make sure that we're complying with DFS, and therefore, it's not really used as much as we would like it to be. 5.9 does give us one more 160 megahertz band, but if you look at six gig, uh, it, it affords us up to 760 megahertz channels that would really, really enable us to capitalize on uh, the uh, goodness that Wi-Fi brings to all of you. With, with six gigahertz, it's also greenfield because uh, you see that there are no legacy devices in the six gigahertz band. There's, there's legacy devices in 2.4, there are legacy devices in five gig that have to contend with 11AX, but with six gigahertz, it's just going to be new devices that are six gig capable, but that are AX capable, as a result of which, you're able to fully schedule traffic in six gigahertz band. So it's all OFDMA, it's all multi-user communication, therefore it's that much more efficient when you're talking six gigahertz Wi-Fi. And it'll also be the most efficient and friendliest technologies as yet, because uh, the airtime overhead is substantially reduced in the six gigahertz band, right? So because, uh, because these are just newer devices, it eliminates about 70% of the overhead required for communication. And these devices can communicate in a much more lower and much more effective power levels than they are doing so today. So they're gonna be less noisier, more friendly 
So this is going to be the most efficient Wi-Fi technologies yet when 6 gigahertz band becomes really, really available. As a result, if you look at sort of the relative compares of the key performance indicators between 2.4, 5, and 6, uh, we do get, you know, double the throughput or more. So double the throughput just in raw